now. Oops. Can you see my screen now or no? Yes. Yeah, I can see it. Okay, good. Can't see you anymore, but I can see your women. Oh, no. <laughs> All right. So Phyllis, when you go to um, up at the top, there's like view options. I, do you see that? Uh, no. No, yeah, I don't see it either, actually. That's kind of weird. I don't know if they changed how it's- The very going. top of my screen? Oh. Yeah. Oh, wait. Uh, Upper right. Give the gospel, mute, stop. Whoa, it was there and then it went away. Well, what am I looking for if it comes back? Okay, come on. View, view options. Yeah, view options. It should it be keeps... side by side. Or, or there's a little box with um, several dots in it that says view, and you can click the speaker view. I, I, I see three little dots, side. but I don't. Uh, come on. Yeah, I don't see it either. Okay, I guess we're just going to have to deal with it. Wait. It's weird because it it took away all the options. It's done this before, where it just takes away the options. Okay, well, sorry. <laughs> Nothing I can do. All right. You know, Karen, I think it depends on what kind of computer you're, if you're on an iPad or a whatever, because mine is just as normal as ever, you know. Mine is too. Mine's yeah. normal. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah I don't know. mine. All right, we're. Um, there. I'm on our iPad. We didn't bring our laptop, so I'm on our, my iPad. So that explains why it's not the same. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, mine's just mine's different, but okay, we'll just go with it. Um. So anyway, um, does anybody remember the Bent Woman? Like, are you used to this story? Yeah, no. me neither. Yeah, I, I don't remember it. I don't know if it's not in the lectionary or what. I hadn't checked. I forgot to check. But at any rate, hopefully you see my screen now. Um, one of the things that this story talks about, at least a little bit, kind of implied, is this woman is disabled. Wait a minute. Okay, now it's really screwy. Because it's not... Okay, something's really weird because it's not doing what I'm expecting it to do. Oh, there we go, okay. <laughs> Goodness, okay. So how do we wanna talk about a person who is disabled? Because that language has changed through the years. Yeah, sometimes we say differently abled. Yeah. And sometimes rather than using an adjective, we say a person with disabilities. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, too. Yeah. I we don't know why she was bent, but a person, a woman who was bent or a person, a woman whose spine was bent or whatever. I don't know how she was bent, but. Yeah, right. yeah we're not really told how. She's but a woman I, first. Say again. She's a woman first. Yes, I agree. Yeah, because when you say disabled woman, for example, then you are kind of making her, that's her identity. Right. And right. you don't woman. really want to do that. Right. Yeah, okay. Just want to make sure we're all kind of on the same page there. All right. So um, as we look at this story, it is a healing story, but it's also a controversy story. So we'll look at those. And... A healing story is it has a problem, a solution, and then a proof of the healing. But this story adds a controversial story at the end where Jesus confronts the one who is not doing God's will and then enlightens them. Okay. On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up and praised God. So in this healing story, 
there is a problem. The problem is that she's crippled by a spirit for 18 years. The solution is she's set free. And then the proof is she's straightened up and praised God. So what stands out to you as we read this story? She doesn't approach him and ask to be healed. Yes, right. And that is a difference of the gospel of Luke versus some of the other ones. Um, you remember is the canine woman where she actually was proactive and said, I want to be healed, right? So Luke is more of a, he kind of keeps the women in their roles, you know? So that's a difference. Other thoughts? What about the spirit? Can you hear me? Yes. I wondered uh, how old she really was. When I first read it, I thought she was 18. Mm -hmm. But then when I reread it, I thought it, all it says is she was crippled for 18 years. So I guess I want to know um, when she became crippled mm -hmm. and possibly why. So right. That I just started to question it. Uh, I took it at face value um, all these years, I guess. And then today I looked at it and said, hmm, I wonder how old she was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're not really told how old she is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we don't know. Okay, good. Other thoughts? Jesus sets her free from her infirmity rather than saying, I'm casting out the spirit in you. Mm hmm. Yeah, so what does that imply to you? Well, it really brings up some deep questions about whether people who have physical ailments are suffering from a spiritual possession. Could be. I would say that, you know, based on what I've read, certainly it's not something that God does where God says, you have sinned, and so therefore I give you this infirmity. Um, so we definitely need to make sure that people don't think that way. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I think that's putting God into a, a, a wrathful box, I guess. So I don't really like that personally. Other thoughts? Okay. So spirit, we talked about that a little bit. Um, it says in, in my, one of my translations, I think it was, that it's a spirit of weakness. So she's, um, what does that bring to mind? Um, I think there's people who think that people who are ill are, are, are weak and, and that there's something that they can do to prevent it. And, you know, there's certainly things you can do to prevent illness, but, you know, it, maybe that's that weak spirit was a way to kind of put her aside to say she's weak. So therefore that's what she has to live with. Mm. But let me turn that a little bit. Is, is she weak because she has to deal with whatever this is? Yeah. yeah. I guess we could speculate as to what medical condition she had. I don't know that that's especially useful. Yeah. Some, uh, some other thoughts. Um, she could be dealing with an addiction, an illness, a lack of self-esteem. Mm -hmm. Any of those types of things as well. So something that the book, the book Back to the Well said, Sin typically is said to be pride, self-centeredness, and repenting of Uh-oh. Karen, you're frozen. Self, but as an empowerment towards the discovery of self, an affirmation of one's strengths, giftedness, and responsibility. What do you think about this concept of sin as a lack of self-esteem? 
we heard you say that sin is often thought of as pride. And then you said, and repenting of it. And then we lost you. Oh, all the rest. Okay. So, um, so repenting of a sin of pride would be self-sacrifice, right? So saying, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking too much of myself. So I need to let that go. So what about those who have a lack of self and over-dependence on others for your self-identity? Grace, in this case, is not a call to a loss of self, but is an empowerment towards the discovery of self, an affirmation of one's strengths, giftedness, and responsibility. What do you think of this as a sin of lack of self-esteem? I've heard this before, and, and I think it's true that there was a time when preachers preaching about sin equated it with pride or trying to take over what belongs to God. But I think that isn't done as much as it used to be done. Or it certainly isn't done in our congregation. Um, I think both making yourself too important and making yourself not important enough are are displeasing to God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're not valuing God's creation. Other thoughts? And when I read this, I don't see a, I see a physical, um, issue and that she could not straighten up at all. Mm -hmm. If if it was a self-esteem issue, if it was a I feel bad about myself issue and she always kind of hunched over, that's one thing. But it's the could not straighten up at all tells me there was a that there was a physical inability to do so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So that's one in, one interpretation. Yes, absolutely. After yeah. after World War One there was a large number of soldiers who developed physical disabilities and um, were not able to walk or were not able to hold things in their hands. And after World War II, the manifestation of what was called shell shock was quite different. It wasn't so much expressed in people's bodies as it was expressed in, in the words that they smoke, spoke and nightmares and rages. So some of it has to do with what your culture tells you is going to happen to you if you're um, a traumatized person. And the kind of trauma that, you're, that you experience is less important than what your culture accepts as the behavior of a traumatized person. So her inability to straighten up could be the result of some horrible trauma in her life. And that came out as a physical manifestation. Yeah. Yeah, it, it also kind of implies that she's not having a full view of life, that she can't see others face to face. So yeah, that's, that's kind of what I was getting at. <laughs> yeah. She's always looking at her toes, right? Or she's not looking directly into people's eyes. So it could be physical, it could be emotional. Yeah, all of the above. Okay, so what about the number? Um, Marianne mentioned the 18 years. What, what do you think that, um, you know what, you're not gonna, <laughs> you're not gonna pull this out of the hat. I was well, like, <laughs> the numbers that I, I know from the scripture are seven, 40, and 12. So no, I don't know anything about 18. Yeah. Because I was looking at my note, I'm like, yeah, nobody's going to know this. <laughs> I didn't know it either. Um, so the 18 years is um, symbolic of Israel's bondage to the Moab and the Philistines and the Amorites. And this happens in Judges. Um, but this is also about half of a typical adult life at the time. Remember, we talked about that word, like 30, 40 is probably about your lifetime. Um, but this hasn't dampened her spirituality. She's still going to the synagogue on the Sabbath. So why is she there? Do we know why she's there? 
Can we make assumptions? But we can assume that she's there to pray and sacrifice. Yeah, I think so. We can assume she's been faithful, even in the midst and length of that duration of suffering. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. Okay. She might be there because she heard that Jesus was going to be teaching. That could be too. Although she's off on the side, I think. Oh, you know what? I don't think we've gotten there yet. Oh, where okay. she is. Yeah, we haven't gotten there yet. Okay. Um, but what is the assumption that Jesus makes? I think we kind of covered this. Well, he doesn't ask her, do you want to be set free from your infirmity? Yeah. So he's assuming that she wants to be healed. Um, but, you know, I guess we, we can assume that Jesus knows, but <laughs> it does seem to be less of a letting her assert herself. So, okay. I'll go back to this. Okay, back to the story. Indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue leader said to the people, there are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. The Lord answered him, you hypocrites, doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? Okay, so... Let's see. So this is a controversy story, as I talked about. So he confront, Jesus confronts with you hypocrites, which is what he saves for the people that he thinks are, are doing obviously inconsistent with God's will. He thinks this is, this is stupid, which, okay. <laughs> um, but who does the synagogue leader address? The people. Yeah. Why does he address the people in this case? Any ideas? Like he's assuming that the woman came to get healed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Well, we know that the leaders of the synagogue were unhappy with Jesus and that they wanted the people to turn against Jesus and in the end succeeded <clears throat> at getting people to turn against Jesus. So it could be consistent with that. That's true. Yeah. yeah. I think he was scolding them in order to conform. You guys are breaking the norms here. Guilt. Oh, yeah. But, you know, what's interesting, though, is that Jesus was the one who was breaking the norms, not the people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think he's, I think he's kind of scared of them. But it also what happens is it makes it a public discussion right as scott was saying where it's it's bringing everybody in and going okay this isn't how we want things done you know yeah i wonder how they would feel if they had a medical emergency on a sabbath <laughs> <laughs> i agree <laughs> okay then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on a Sabbath day from what bound her? When he said this, all his opponents were humiliated, but the people were delighted with all the wonderful things he was doing. So this is the conclusion to that controversy where Jesus pronounces that you set free on the Sabbath. Let's see. Um, and Satan has bound, that's one of the things that we talk about in this part, evil has caused her not to live life to its fullest or not as God has intended. So what do we know about the Sabbath? Goes from sundown on Friday till sundown on Saturday. Okay. What's the purpose? A day of rest. Day of rest. Yeah. And worship. And worship. worship. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so Jesus isn't. Sorry, I missed something. Yeah. Okay. Jesus isn't saying that the Sabbath should not be observed. He's critiquing how it's observed. 
The animals were untied because it was cruel to keep them tied up. He's untying the woman, just as the oxen and the donkey were untied, releasing her from captivity. Freedom and liberation are what the Sabbath is about. He's fulfilling the Sabbath. The religious leader is putting the laws or the system before the person. Okay, so that phrase, daughter of Abraham, only appears here in the New Testament. Any idea what that means? I assume it means she's Jewish. Yeah, that she's Jewish. Yeah, absolutely. She's in the temple or she's in the synagogue. So, yeah. What she about belongs? She belongs. Nice. Uh huh. The lineage of faithful. The lineage of faithful. Yep. So it, it IDs her as a a child of the covenant promise. So what what God said to Abraham, and actually I have that right here. <laughs> the Lord had said to Abraham, actually Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And this is significant for the reasons that we talked about, but it also, it's one of the few places where the woman is described as the daughter of Abraham, usually it's the son of Abraham. So whom do you identify with in this story? Any thoughts? Well, I, I, I certainly identify with the woman who has challenges to overcome. I feel I have challenges to overcome. Mm -hmm. What about the religious leaders? Do we see where they're what, coming from? What about what? The religious leaders, do we see where they're coming from? Uh, yeah. Well, sure. There are times when I get caught up in the rules and want the rules enforced, even if it's not good. Yeah, I'm sure I'm guilty of that too. Well, it's um, also a, a power thing. It's like um, our rules, we are the ones in control. Jesus is the one who's who's bending that, stepping out and doing something different and they want to shut, shut him down. Uh, it's, a, it's a lack of control there. Um, it, it just is so little information on why she couldn't stand up that it's, I guess it's better to keep that as a general thing and not get too crazy about specifically what it was. But um, <laughs> there are so many infirmities. Um, we have a lady in our Beaverton Lodge who is like at a right angle. She's bent completely over at the waist uses a walker and she can go faster than any of the rest of us. And has a great <laughs> spirit and is very active in her church. Collects egg cartons for their pantry to refill. But also think about judging others. You know, on your way to church, um, we can be critical of those out uh, mowing their yards. I know uh, one of the Methodist ministers here was telling her sister, uh, in the South, people really observe the Sabbath and everybody on the street will be driving at, at that time to the church. Whereas in this part of the country, it's, a, it's not such an emphasis on church and attendance. And when the sister moved to Tennessee, she found that that was true. There was a very big difference at that time between observance of, of worship and Sunday mornings than there is in the West. Yeah. 
Thanks. Um, I, I would, uh, to, to go back to <clears throat> the different people in the scene, um, I, I was really happy about the part that the people, the people disagreed with the leaders, at least for that moment, you know, they were happy with what Jesus was doing. And, and it just it crossed my mind. This is a little bit like the censorship of Liz Cheney this week. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like, you know, yeah. She was breaking the rules by, you know, and so they censored her that the trouble is that, you know, the, the people didn't go along um, or, or they went along with the leader's rules. Pretty um, scary. Yeah. Mm, yeah. So that's something we can learn from this story too, that we don't have to necessarily go along with the leaders if we don't agree with what's going on. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. We remain in the Republican Party, apparently you need to. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about the Jesus shouldn't have healed on the Sabbath, we had a, a church Sunday school teacher and she had had problems with her legs and had been seeing a doctor and she called him several times on the weekend about what was going on with her legs and said, oh, it'll be all right, you know, just wait till Monday. Well, Monday she had to have both her legs amputated because he didn't work on the Sabbath. <laughs> oh, geez. Thanks. I think the story kind of exhorts us to look at the big picture when related to the rules. Um, and, you know, th there's a place for rules, but as you look at the big picture, caring and healing, compassion should not be usurped by rules. Mm -hmm. That yeah. seems that seems a lot the point of the picture thing to me. That seems like a good uh, yeah. and focus, if you will. Mm -hmm. From that perspective, I, I can certainly identify with the leaders because, you know, we're always expected to kind of um, follow the rules, maintain the system. And whenever it's someone comes up with an idea, everyone, I think most people tend to have a knee-jerk reaction, you know, and it's usually wrong. So, yeah. Yeah, and there's that, that we've always done it this way. So why do we need to change it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and there's, there's reasons for doing it that way. If you've always done it that way, then there's, there's reasons that that, that has worked. But yeah. it, when it gets institutionalized and then unexamined, and we can, you know, when a, a law comes out of a need and a um, a circumstance that exists and it's real and it works but if it gets into being a institutionalized and it's just on the books and eventually no longer appropriate but nobody looks at it you know that's it goes too far I guess is what I'm thinking I'm thinking that Jesus is saying um that even though it's the Sabbath and you don't work on the Sabbath, there are small things that are <laughs> humane. Um, it, it wasn't meant to be um, that you were thrown in jail on the, on the Sabbath and couldn't do anything. There was a woman in a church I went to in Eugene, who as, a, as a young wife, her husband would make her go sit in a, under a tree in the yard with him and read her Bible, and she couldn't she couldn't do any work on the Sabbath, so and she wasn't real happy with it. <laughs> watching adult dead class. Um, yeah, I think one of the lessons here is that the Sabbath is supposed to serve yeah. us and sure. not us serving the Sabbath. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay, bye. So what do, what do we learn about Jesus in this story? What does he look like? He's teaching the Pharisees. Mm-hmm. He likes to teach the Pharisees. <laughs> you know, I, I was struck by the fact that he reached out. This woman did not ask for help. I yeah. mean, he reached out to her. And to me, that just speaks to his compassion in his understanding that people are hurt and he he can free them. And he can see it, yeah. Yeah. Right. 
yeah, that's, I guess that's a lesson too, is like to be aware of other people's pain. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question about Pharisees. Some of you may know more than I do. Are they, they were all lawyers. Um, I mean, Peter was a Pharisee, I think. Paul was definitely a Pharisee. Um, maybe, let's see. Well, there were some others. Um, Flavius Josephus was a, um, was a military commander. I mean, it seems like there's a Pharisee under every bush. <laughs> Who were the Pharisees? <laughs> As I understand it, they're, they're the people that actually know the laws, the Jewish laws, all those big long ones that are in Leviticus and stuff. So they were lawyers. Or somebody who, who um, judges. Or who just lived the law, supposedly lived the law very, very strictly. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's more of it where it's they lived it very very strictly I don't know that it was necessarily that they were all lawyers but that was their like sect were they and church they officials mm -hmm. most of them were church officials so they kind of ruled the synagogues in a way and the Sadducees were Hellenized they were more uh, open to the Greek style of things. Yeah, like Pharisees um, believed in the resurrection and the Sadducees did not. Hmm. That's probably the whole different class. <laughs> <laughs> like the differences between those two. Um, and I think another thing we can learn from this story about Jesus is that he doesn't want us to suffer and that we shouldn't put things off that are kind. Mm -hmm. yeah, there are times when I wonder, you know, how much should I reach out when somebody's having trouble finding their money in the purse? Do you embarrass them by saying, well, let me get it? Or if a parent's talking to the child in a way that you think is is really harmful for their confidence. Do, you know, do you speak out? It's hard to know. It's hard for me to know when to intercede and when not to. Yeah, that's one of those art things, not science. <laughs> There's no right answer. It's just how you feel in that moment, what your gut tells you. Yeah. But of course, Jesus was Jesus, and so he didn't hesitate to do what he knew he could do and she would want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, sometimes um, we're get a, given the opportunity to lay a burden down. Um, just like she, he, he said that she could, uh, you know, could raise, could stand up. Um, I don't know where I'm going with this, but, but like, you know, what, um, was it Fran just said, um, one time we were in the grocery store when my husband was already quite ill and he was having trouble, um, getting, getting money, getting his, you know, he, he would forget things, the card, how to do the card, and, and maybe his card wasn't with him, his billfold wasn't with him, I think, maybe. Um, and I was there, I don't know, I, I witnessed this, so I'm wondering why I didn't step in, and so we were just, it was just giving him time to try to make it work. The guy behind us got really impatient, and we, it went on way too long, and stepped in and said, I'll pay for it. You know, yeah, a little bit of grace in that moment. I know I took my visiting elderly mother out to eat, and then she wanted to go to a store in the same little mall. And so we walked down there, and when it came time to walk back to the car, she was incapable of 
supporting herself. And so I was trying to get her into the car and holding her against the back door closed and opening the other door and trying to get her in. And this man came and looked at us and never offered to help. And I thought, it would have been so nice if he had said, can I help you? Or why didn't I say, would you help us? I'm glad she didn't fall and collapse and break something. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we can't always assume that people see what when we need help. So we have to ask for it sometimes. Yeah. It's hard. Okay. Who is who is bound in the story? Well, certainly the woman, mm -hmm. but I think the um, the Pharisees that were bound to the law, rather than seeing that big picture as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. What about if, see, here's the tricky one is, are we the ones who are bound if we assume that she needs healing? Is it possible to feel whole while being differently abled? It's a good question. And sometimes, you know, you're heightened. They talk about the blind person who is able to hear more because they can't see. So the other senses take over a little bit more. So, you know, maybe she didn't need healing. Just a thought. So I'm thinking about the people in the congregation who essentially cheered Jesus uh, after he said what he said about taking care of people is maybe they also were bound in the law and were beginning to see sort of um, openings in the, those boundaries or something like that, that, you know, they were saying, oh, maybe we need to rethink what we have always thought, which is you can't lift a finger on the Sabbath. You think about sort of this philosophy that Jesus had, which was love others, take care of others, um, do unto others. And, you know, maybe it was a bit liberating for them from their boundaries. I don't know. I'm, that's it. Yeah. Oh, oh Bev, that's... I. That's perfect. I, I totally oh. agree. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Agreed. I remember being a little kid. Um, I grew up on a farm and we had livestock. And I, I always worried about the fact that my dad worked on the Sabbath because, of course, he had to do the chores to take care of the livestock. And uh, this story might have come out or another one, which gave me some relief that my dad wasn't a terrible sinner because he had to go out to the barns on Sunday two times in the morning because, you know, those those animals can't they just take, care. they can't take Sunday off from <laughs> what their needs are. And I just remember some relief. I don't remember this story at all, but I must have learned that in some story that my daddy was really okay because he was doing the right thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cool. All right. Um, let's see. So are we bound as a society in any ways that you can think of? Well, we've all turned it around and made it, you, you've got to keep working on Sunday. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, so maybe we've gone too far the other way. So yeah. Mm -hmm. we're bound by a lot of rules that we don't necessarily see mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. um, like you were talking okay. about the mowing the lawn on, on Sunday uh, that could very easily be somebody who is of a different faith but we tend to see it through our own lens and constrict people's behavior by that Yeah. And are we, oh, go ahead, Lynn, you have something? No. No, okay. Um, 
I think as we look at the people that are differently abled, if you look at how our world is set up, it's not set up for those dis differently abled. So that may be something that we need to look at as well. Um, I have a friend who is differently abled and looking at their apartment, it's like, okay, so if you're in a wheelchair and you're going into the kitchen, you can't reach anything. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and how are we set up just in our society, just in different places, even our churches, um, we're not set up to include them. So it's something to think about as well. It's cheaper not to be. <laughs> it does cost it's, a lot. Agree. It costs it costs money to build wider doorways and and have things. But um, if we accommodated more disabilities, and there are a lot of disabilities, it's not you know that's yeah. that's the difference between like seniors and disabled seniors is somewhat a unified group, but disability is all over the place. Um, but people, it helps everybody, okay? Uh, a railing, a railing to get up some stairs. There's a lot of people that don't have to have one, but it makes it easier for them. Or having something to do with enough lighting so you can see there's people that are blind, but it sure helps. You know, there's a continuum of disability. And certainly when you're at the, at the, dis, the end where you definitely are disabled, you need help. But there's also this intermediate space. Um, anyway, that's. No, thank you for that, Peggy. Yeah. Yeah. And Peggy, when I see a handrail, like I might not need it now. You know, I definitely didn't need it 10 years ago. I know I'm going to need it in the next 10 years. You know, we, we all are going to need that handrail. I mean, and that's just a small example. Right. And there are, there is improvement in the society. Um, the law um, to do things for the handicap, like uh, curbs, having, you know, a place where you don't have to step over. Um, the you know the sidewalk you have to have a place um, that's helped. And since I spent my life in special ed, um, yeah, ninety four one forty two did a lot. Yeah. Well, well I, and the ADA Act, of course. Yeah, ADA. Yeah. yeah, ADA was great. Yeah. Yeah. When I was in nursing school in the eighty early seventies, um, one of our assignments was actually to um, spend the day in a wheelchair uh -huh. and and go someplace so i like i went to the mall in a wheelchair and um it was it was so enlightening and and the whole idea was to be enlightened right to understand what people who had a disability felt like and um it it was amazing i was really surprised how and, and things i had never considered like being able to reach things and I'm short. So being able to reach things is always a problem, but when you're in a wheelchair, it's even worse. But in those days, they didn't have the curb things. Yeah. And, and so how do you get from one story to the another? You have to find the lone elevator in the entire mall. And, you know, those things are, are challenging. Can you even reach the buttons in the elevator? Yeah. Well, I fortunately could do that, but yeah. <laughs> Think how fast you could zip from store to store, though. <laughs> <laughs> True. You know, you know, the interesting thing is that um, some of you know that when I go out, I have my, my staff with me. And um, this week is kind of liberating because I was able to do a lot of things. And I'm going into a store, uh, happened to be, um, well, it doesn't matter. And this man stops and he wants to help me. I'm saying, no, I don't need help. And another person stopped me at another place. And I thought, you know what? This is really okay, Marianne. Just take help if somebody asks you, you know? It's not embarrassing. And Luann, I have to share this with you. My assignment as a speech pathologist was to be a stutterer for a day. 
Uh, <laughs> wow. And it was it was awful. My my um, my brother um, stuttered when he was young, and that's what made me interested in speech pathology. But anyhow, being handicapped in speech for a day was um, very bad for me. Yeah. Um, it was an interesting lesson. And being old and needing some help is an interesting experience too, you know? Well, yeah. more, many of you have already touched on it with, you know, your story, Marianne, and yours also, Fran, about needing help and not receiving it or receiving help but not wanting it. So it's that difficult navigation we have to do. Do you open a door? Do you ask someone if they want help? Or I just think you have to be respectful when you ask and yeah. do so anyway. And, and also gracious and accepting help mm -hmm. as yeah. well. I mean, yeah, yeah I, I used to, when I worked in Portland, I took the Max in. That, that was my transportation. And, you know, at first people would say, do you want my seat? And I'd say, oh, no, I'm fine. I, I can stand up. I can, you know, hold on to the strap. And then I thought, you know what? It benefits both of us for me to take that seat because I sit down and the person who offered feels like they did the right thing. And yeah. so, you know, it's like to, the reward goes both ways. So now I say, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yes, of course. I'll take when, when to quit being tough. Yeah. <laughs> when to quit being tough. And <laughs> is being does being tough help anybody? It doesn't help me and it doesn't help the person who's asked to help me. So that's kind of, that's kind of a neat lesson, I think. You know, yes, and that goes back to the question on the screen. Are we bound as a society in any ways? It's like, mm -hmm. you've got to be tough and you've got to be, and you've got to work hard and, uh, you know, you have to get ahead. We have so many of those rules that uh, make us not make the right decisions sometimes. Yeah. Uh, and, and if you are letting somebody help you, you are also teaching them so that when they come up against another person or themselves, um, it's like I, I have this uh, uh, routine for getting in the car and I've figured out a way that I can get in the car and uh, but I have to and, and the same with people in wheelchairs they have to train their attendants all the time mm -hmm. about how they want to do a certain thing um, and so we all need training to help the handicapped to some extent or help people with handicaps. I don't like calling them handicapped either, but um, yeah. I know we're, we're running a long time. Did anyone here besides myself attend the Wisdom Calls event last night? It was on Facebook or Zoom. It was on Zoom. So I recommend this. It's a multi-event series put on by the Oregon Synod, lifting up uh, storytelling of women leaders in our church. And so last night they gave four short talks over the hour. And one of the ladies talked about her call in the eighties and what she had to fight, right. To be respected, mm -hmm. to become a leader, how she went to seminary and out of the hundreds of men, there were only two women and she was studying Greek and therefore was pressured, you know, her PhD, whatever uh, grad student who was teaching the class expected her to sleep with him. And then when she finally got off to her internship, it was like, oh my gosh, finally. And then she was told in Denton, Texas, the town known for the two of the last five um, US and Miss USAs at the time was told, oh no, no, you can't help by picking up dirty communion cups. We'd never help with that. That's the men. <laughs> so she's her, and then finally, 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 she was allowed to help at the next place. And she thought she had it. And then the leader of the senators wanted to speak with her, came in and talked with her advisor privately, then sat down to talk with her and said, very succinctly, she said, this congregation's going down the toilet and it's because of you. Oh. Awkward, didn't know what to say. Why am I sharing this? Because she just sat there too and she shared what she said, which was, but I, but I feel I'm called by God. And he got up and walked away. She never heard from him again. So talk about pushing back against norms, right? Yeah. Wow. Beautiful stories. Uh, Wisdom Calls, Oregon Senate sponsors these events. And yeah. Yeah, thanks, Scott. Cool. 
All right. Um, the last one is just a question. Um, what have we not covered that you'd be interested in in the future? What women? You know, most of the women in the, that, well, not all of them, but some of, a lot of the women that we've talked about are women who are in need of healing from Jesus. And um, the women of the Old Testament mm -hmm. were standard setters. And mm -hmm. I'd like to learn more about them. Okay. I'd like to learn about women who are in leadership roles. Mm hmm Good. All right. That's all I have. Thank, thank you, Karen. Karen. You're yeah. welcome. Yeah, thanks thank so you. much.